Sometimes it feels like I'm watching from the outside. Sometimes it feels like I'm breathing. But am I alive? I'm going to keep searching for answers that aren't here to find. Oh. Welcome to Bex Reform Church, all of our members and our guests that we have today and all the uh, friends that are watching online. We're so glad you're with us today. Um, today is uh, Communion Sunday, so we are kind of doing things a little bit differently, but um, uh, I'm sure Roland, they'll announce how we're going to be doing that in just a moment. Uh, do we have any other announcements? I know we've got a consistory meeting tomorrow night. Um, then on Wednesday, the Sunrise Citizens are going to meet with, uh, at Mike's Place. Uh, please RSVP to Brenda Burris. This is me. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, that's too far in advance to put that on the calendar. <laughs> All right, so not tomorrow night on the 17th, and then on the 19th, the Sunrise Citizens. All right, any uh, any other announcements that we have today? No. Let's all stand together and sing our opening song today, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. <clears throat>
smallest grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior Please be seated. Good morning. Um, the flowers on the altar today are given to the glory of God in loving honor of Martha Bonner on her birthday and Rhonda Smith on hers. Um, special time of our prayer we will lift the names up to the Lord um, our list is long and um, we got a very capable Lord of handling it um, remember the family of Dale Block Jordan Smith a lung transplant plant Marie Gobbles in the hospital um, Lindsay Davison and remember one of our brothers Jimmy Wilkes we lost him last week but keep his family in prayers well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, our heavenly Savior, our everything, Lord, we um, lift these names to you, Lord. We ask that you would touch them in a special way, Lord. We ask that you would anoint them, if it be thy will, Lord, just um, mostly give them comfort and peace, knowing that all things are in your hands. 
Lord, we ask that you would guide and lead us through this week, Lord. Um, let your love and the Holy Spirit just pour from us, Lord. Just be with the lost, Lord. Let us seek those that do not know you. Let us be quick to share the good news that was once shared with us. Lord, as in all things, Lord, we just ask that you would guide and lead us in all we do. And most of all, Lord, we give thanks for you. And it's in your son's name, Christ Jesus, we pray all things. Amen. We'll continue our worship with the offering. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for these offerings, Lord. We ask that you would use them to grow your kingdom, to spread the good news, the love of your Son, Jesus Christ. In all things, we give you thanks. Amen. We ask that our elders please come forward and prepare to serve the communion this morning. Well, we're doing things a little differently today, as you can tell. Um, we're going to ask you at the appropriate time to come forward and make two lines down the middle aisle and receive the bread and the juice from either the left side or the right side and then return to your seat. Uh, this is called intinction. Uh, my youth group like to call it rip and dip. Uh, <laughs> But it's a very personal way to receive communion, to receive the bread and to receive the cup. And it's something that we, as a consistory, as myself, we decided that would be, be a good thing moving forward as we, we talk.
talk about being together as a congregation and, and this togetherness, it certainly, w during this time of communion, it certainly accomplishes that. So, again, when we finish uh, my words, you'll a I'll ask you to come forward, make two lines, receive the communion, and then return to your seat. This is the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not a Bex Reformed Church table. This is a table of our Lord. And anyone here today who is a guest of ours, and we're certainly glad you're here, if you have confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are welcome to this table because it is a table of our Lord. Minded of a story some years ago, many years ago, of a young boy who didn't do what his mom and dad said. Uh, he liked to play outside uh, longer than he should. This was a time when mom would call out the door and say, Billy, it's time for supper. Well, Billy didn't come. And it happened more than once. And so finally, Billy's dad said, the next time that you're late for supper, you're going to get bread and water. Well, a couple of days later, Billy was playing. His friend said, Billy, I think I hear your mom calling you. He ran as fast as he could to the, t to the house. And when he walked in, there was a table spread for a king. There was fried chicken, mashed potatoes, gravy, rolls. Herbert, you're drooling. <laughs> <laughs> Billy took his place at the table. And his mother heaped up a big plate of chicken and mashed potatoes and corn and all kinds of stuff and placed it before his father, and then for Billy, he got a plate of simple bread and a glass of water. His dad let it settle in for just a moment, and then his dad did something Billy never forgot. Billy's dad stood up and took his plate and placed it before Billy, and his dad took the bread and the water. God has done the same for us, my friends. He does not give us what we deserve. He gives us the feast, the whole meal. This may not seem like a feast to you, but it is a feast because of what it represents. It represents the blood and the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us celebrate this meal together. Loving God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would descend upon this bread and cup and that you would take what is ordinary bread and juice and that you would transform it into something holy, something supernatural. And that it would infuse our bodies with your Spirit and with this promise that every time we celebrate this meal, we proclaim your son's death until he comes again. Father, we ask this prayer in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. On the night of Jesus' betrayal, Jesus sat down with his friends, his disciples, and Scripture says that he took the bread and after blessing it, he broke it. And he said, This is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after he took the bread, he then took the cup, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the remission of your sins. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. Together, let's celebrate this holy meal that Jesus has given us. Please come forward at this time.
Let us pray. Father, thank you for the celebration of this meal. Oh, Father, we look for the day that we'll celebrate this meal with you in heaven. And your narrow pierced hands will tear the bread and pour the cup. And we will celebrate with everyone in your kingdom. Oh, we look to that day. But Father, we are here, in the, here and now. And we face struggles and we face difficulties every single day. And so we request your Holy Spirit surge through our veins and course through our bodies and give us strength and hope in the days to come. Father, we ask this prayer in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to invite you now to stand up and visit with someone and welcome them here. Give them a big Bex welcome. Hey, hey. I need to move this over. Where are we going? This way. I just don't want to fall off the edge. Yeah, there we go. Yep, that's great. Thank you. Well, that worked well. <laughs> Did you get communion? Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, I was thinking. I was thinking. I gotta get over there. <laughs>
Well, good morning to you again. Glad you're here with us. If you're a guest, we're certainly glad you're here with us today. Uh, we are continuing a series we began several weeks ago as we've been looking toward eternity. And before we begin, how about a, a big hand for our choir and for our praise team this morning? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you. You set the, the course for this message today. And we're talking about eternity. Over the last several weeks, we have talked about what that day will look like. Jude calls it a great day. It is a great day that we're looking to. And then last week, we talked about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for those of us who place our trust in Christ and follow Him, we are promised a like resurrection as Jesus had. Well, today we're going to continue our series as we talk about that great reunion in the sky. Before we begin, though, let's ask God's blessing on our time together. Thank you, God, so much. Oh, thank you for, so much for this day that you've given us, a time to worship you, to praise you, to lift you up, a time to celebrate the, the communion, the supper that you have passed on to us. As we celebrate that and remember your death and remember that you are coming again just as you promised. And so, Father, today we ask that you be with our, us during our time together and that you will speak, Father. Your spirit will hover and move in this room as it did on the day of Pentecost, that you will move in the hearts of people. Father, we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. If you ever need a reminder of the frailty of humanity, I have a scene for you to witness. The next time you think people have grown too stoic and too self-sufficient, I have a place for you to go. Should you ever worry that the hearts have become too hard and tears are too rare, then I want to take you to a place where the knees of men buckle and the tears of women flow. Let me take you to a school and watch the parents as, as they leave their children in class for the very first time. It's a traumatic event. Long after the school bell has rung, and the classes have begun. Adults linger in the parking lot, offering words of comfort and starting support groups. <laughs> Even though parents know the school is good, that the education is right, and that they'll see their little kids just four short hours later, they still don't like to say goodbye. We don't like to say goodbye to those we love. But what is experienced at school in August is a picnic compared to what is experienced at a cemetery at death. It's one thing to leave your loved ones in familiar surroundings, but it's something else entirely to release them and to a world we do not know, in a world we cannot describe. We don't like to say goodbye to those we love, but we have to. Try, try as we might to avoid it, reluctant as we are to discuss it, death is a very real part of life. Each, must, each one of us must release the hand of the one we love into the hand of the one we have not seen. Can you remember the first time you were forced to say goodbye? Most of us can. I know I can. One day when I was about 10 years old, I was called to the principal's office at school. I went to the office and there was my grandma. I'd never seen her like that before and her appearance shocked me. And even at 10 years old, I knew something was wrong. And she, she just said these words, your grandpa has passed away. 
At the funeral, I heard words like departed, passed on, gone ahead. These were unfamiliar terms, and I wondered, departed to where, passed on to what, gone ahead for how long? Of course, I've learned since then that I'm not the only one who has questions about death. Listen to any discussion about the return of Christ, and someone will inquire, but what about those who have already died? What happens to Christians between death and Jesus' return? Apparently, the church in Thessalonica had asked such questions, and God's word to them and God's word to us this morning is this, if you're filling in blanks, it's your first point on your outline. God transforms our hopeless grief into hope-filled grief. God transforms this hopeless grief into hope-filled grief. Listen to Paul's words to the church there in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. Now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to believers who die so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. The Thessalonian church had buried their fair share of loved ones. And Paul wanted the members who remained to be at peace regarding the ones who had gone ahead. Many of you as well have buried loved ones. And just as God spoke to them, he speaks to you. If you're celebrating a marriage anniversary alone this year, God speaks to you. If your child made it to heaven before they made it to kindergarten, God speaks to you. If you lost a loved one due to violence, or if you learned more about a disease than you ever wanted to know, or if your dreams were buried as they lowered the casket, God speaks to you. He speaks to all of us who have stood or will stand in the soft dirt near an open grave. And to us, he gives this confident word in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 14. Now, dear brothers and sisters, we do not want you, we, we want you to know what will happen to believers who die, so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Over 40 plus years of ministry, I've witnessed what Paul describes here. I've seen families who grieve the loss of a loved one who did not know Christ as Savior. And they did not, as a family, have any hope. It was as if a, a dark cloud of dread settled over them. And for them, the grave was the end. By contrast, I've witnessed families who had loved ones who were believers in Christ. And mind you, their tears of grief were real. And mind you, their grief was real. But there was a, a thread of eternal hope that they would see their mom or their dad or brother or sister, son or daughter, grandparents, husband or wife again. You see, it's right for us to weep. It's right for us to grieve. It's only a human response. But there is no need for us to despair. Now you and I might wonder why God took them home so soon. But they don't. They understand. And we have this assurance that we will see our loved ones again. But secondly, we want another assurance. We want the assurance that they are with God. 
Just as a parent needs to know that their, his or her child is safe at school, we long to know that our loved one is safe in death. We long for assurance that the soul goes immediately to be with God. But dare we believe it? Can we believe it? Well, according to the Bible, we can. Listen to some of the scriptures that speak with an authoritative voice assuring us that at death, the Christian immediately enters into the presence of God and enjoys conscious fellowship with the fathers, Father and those who have gone before. Paul says this in Philippians 1, verses 21 through 23. Paul says, For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what will I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Language here suggests an immediate departure of the soul at death. What Paul is saying here is that at the moment he departs or the moment he dies, that very moment he will be with Christ. Another clue comes from the letter of Paul that he wrote to the Corinthians. Perhaps you've heard the phrase, to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. Maybe you've heard that. Well, Paul used it first in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. We really want to be away from the body and be at home with the Lord. At the second coming of Christ, our bodies will be resurrected but obviously Paul is not speaking of that in this verse. Otherwise, he would not have used the phrase away from the body. Paul is describing a phase after our death and prior to the resurrection of our bodies. And during this time, we will be at home with the Lord. Isn't this the promise that Jesus gave the thief on the cross? Earlier, the thief had rebuked Jesus, but now he repents and asks for mercy. When he says to Jesus in Luke 23, verse 42, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, likely, the thief is thinking about a time in some distant future when the kingdom comes. He didn't expect an immediate answer. He received one from Jesus in that very same verse in Luke 23, verse 42. I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Now the primary message of this passage is God's unlimited and surprising grace. But a secondary message is the immediate transition of the saved into the presence of God. The soul of the believer. In Acts 7 verse 56 it says Stephen was being martyred. He said, I saw the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at God's right side. As he was nearing death, he prayed in Acts 7 verse 59, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And it's safe to assume Jesus did exactly that. Though the body of Stephen died, his spirit was alive. Though his body was buried, his spirit was in the presence of Jesus himself. Now, some don't agree with this thought. They propose an intermediate period of purgatory, a, a holding tank, if you will, in which we are punished for our sins. This purgatory is a place for an undetermined amount of time. We receive what our sins deserve so we can rightly receive what God has prepared. But there are two problematic things about this teaching. For one, none of us can endure what our sins deserve. 
And for another, Jesus already has. The Bible teaches in Romans 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death, not purgatory, but death. The Bible also teaches that Jesus took our punishment. Hebrews 1, verse 3 says, when he cleansed us from our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. There is no purgatory because Christ took upon himself all of our sins. Others feel that the body is buried and the soul sleeps. And they come by this con conviction naturally and, and honestly enough. Seven times in two different epistles, Paul uses the term sleep to refer to death. And one could certainly deduce that the time spent between death and the resurrection is spent sleeping. I know that pleases some of you. <laughs> but there is a problem. The Bible refers to some who have already died, but they're anything but asleep. Their bodies are asleep, but their souls are wide awake. Consider a few in Revelation 6, verses 9 through 10, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. They shouted to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? In Matthew 17, verse 3, on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus, it says, Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. And in Hebrews 12, verse 1, we hear about this great cloud of witnesses, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Could this not be the heroes of our faith? in our loved ones, in our lives, who have gone before us. I believe so. A friend of mine who preaches in Illinois told me the story of when his father passed away this past winter. The funeral was held on a cold, blustery Illinois day. The snow-covered roads halted the funeral procession and so the funeral director told my friend, I'll take your dad's body to the grave. But my friend couldn't bear the thought of missing his father's funeral service and burial. So he and his brothers and sons piled into a four-wheel drive vehicle and followed the hearse. Here's how he described what happened next. We plowed through 10 inches of snow to the cemetery. We got about 50 yards from my dad's grave, and with the wind blowing 25 miles an hour, the six of us lugged up that hill to carry the casket to the gravesite. We watched the body lowered into the grave, and we turned to leave. But I felt something was unfinished. And so I said, I'd like for us to have a prayer. The six of us huddled together and I prayed, Lord, this is such a cold and lonely place. And then I got too choked up to pray anymore. I kept battling to get my composure and then finally I just whispered, but I thank you for we know to be absent from the body is to be safe in your warm arms safely in God's warm arms. One day there's going to be a family reunion in heaven. And what a reunion it will be. And you will see them. That person you're thinking about right now, you will see them. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 16 and 18 reminds us the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, 
we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then we will be with the Lord forever. Death seems to take so much. We bury not just the body, but the the wedding that never happened. Or the golden years we never knew. We bury dreams. But God promises that there is coming a day. A great day when we will see them again. Would you let this promise change you? From mourning to hopeful. From dwelling in the land of goodbyes to dwelling in heaven of hellos. But until then, rest assured that Christ holds them safely in his warm arms. And when Christ comes, we will hold them as well. Oh, we hold on to that promise, Father. We hold on to that promise. Even from the grave, we hear your promises. We know that they are in your arms, safe. And we look to the day, like Paul, when we will see them once again. And there will be no final embrace, but there will be an eternal embrace. Father, we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together and sing the closing hymn, number 542, When We All Get to Heaven.
now that we go in the name of God the Father, the Almighty, and His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit who is with us both now and for all eternity, and all of God's resurrection people said, Amen. Amen.